welcome you're watching Head to Head. I'm Antonina Antosha with UATV. Today we're talking about the revolution in dance, which traced from Kyiv to Hollywood. This weekend, Columbia University professor and dance historian Lynn Garofola will present a series of talks that will deepen our understanding of the choreography for performance called Gas of a famous Ukrainian movie and theater director Les Kurbas. And today we're lucky to have Lynn in our studio. So hello, Ling, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Frankly, I have never heard of such a thing as uh, the revolution of dance, especially that it started from Kiev. Could you please enlighten me? <laughs> <laughs> well, a wonderful uh, uh, choreographer named Bronislava Nijinska lived in Kiev during a really transformative moment of her life from mm -hmm. 1915 to 1921. She was in touch with many of the avant-garde people, the directors and, uh, and painters, in Kiev right after, during the revolution and right after the revolution. And after that, she began making all kinds of really innovative dances. She then emigrated in, in 1921 mm -hmm. and beginning in Paris and then ultimately in the United States, in Hollywood, including uh -huh. Hollywood, uh, where she made A Midsummer Night's Dream, the Max, wonderful Max Reinhardt film classic. Uh, so it really started in this city at a very special moment when almost anything seemed possible. Like what? Well, like new forms of art. Oh. She had originally come to Kiev in 1915 with her husband and they were working at the opera theater mm -hmm. and making dances for operas and she describes it as being a dream from the past. She had been in Paris with the Ballet Russe. Her, husband, uh, her brother was the famed uh, uh, ballet superstar Václav Nijinsky, mm -hmm. and they were doing ballets like The Rite of Spring, which was a celebrated, scandalous, uh, etc. And then she came to Kiev with her husband, and it just seemed like a moment from the past. But then eventually, as interesting arti artists began working in Kiev together in 1917 and 1918, that gave her courage and I think also permission to begin to explore her own work and do some very interesting things in the studio. For instance, some of the very earliest ballets that we know or dances that we know that were completely abstract were done in her studio, which she called the School of Movement in 1920. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what would you call uh, one peculiarity that Bronislava Nijinska brings into the opera dances? The, the, the so-called saying of Bronislava Nijinska that she puts into the dances. I think it's an idea that uh, dance does not have to be representational. That means it doesn't have to tell a story. Um, it doesn't only have to have steps from the classical vocabulary. In, in other words, if you were a ballet dancer, you would have, would have a class in the morning and you do pretty much the same things every day. But you didn't necessarily have to use those movements when you made a dance. The dance could have mm. movements that came from daily life, that came from, some, that came from social dance, that came from almost anything. Mm -hmm. And that they could be combined in a different way with different kinds of music. Um, so it didn't all have to look like the little humpbacked horse. <laughs> 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 okay, tell, me, uh, tell us all about this gas performance. Well, the gas performance, uh, Nijinska, alas, had nothing to do with that. Nevertheless, I think there are certain ideas in the gas performance at the end where you can see connections with the way Nijinska was thinking a few years before and that she would be thinking, continuing to think about when she was in Paris. And in fact... Is that what, what director thought and wanted to uh, I give think the audience? so. And I think... Um, there, uh, his choreographer was actually one of Nijinska's students uh -huh. named Nadia Shuvarska, who remained in, uh, in Kiev and, uh, when Nijinska, uh, left. And I think she incorporated many of the ideas uh -huh. that Nijinska uh -huh. had. She was certainly someone whom Nijinska, um, thought of as someone continuing her path, Although, of course, circumstances change and it was not always possible to continue mm -hmm. um, her path after a, certain, uh, after a certain point. But I think the interest um, that you can um, see in Gas, for instance, the in interest in, um, uh, in 
social dance, for instance, there are some kind of jazzy dances there. Mm -hmm. Nijinska, interestingly, was doing ex virtually the same thing in the West for the Diaghilev Company in some of the ballets that she was uh, doing there. Obviously, very different situations. But one can see a willingness to use the grot um, grotesque, to use other things that it's not just... Um, it's not just ballet, ballet, if you know what I mean. What's the, yeah, I do know you, but um, what, what is the gas performance all about? What's the story of the gas performance? Okay, the ga gas was based on a, um, a play, uh -huh. uh, and then Les Kourbas decided to completely transform it mm -hmm. and uh, make it uh, grotesque, make it other things. And l um, last night I actually saw a rehearsal mm -hmm. here of a, um, of an opera, if you can call it. It's a very untraditional opera uh, that was inspired by some of the ideas that um, uh, uh, that Kurbas was using when he did his production mm -hmm. in the 1920s. And um, it's going to be premiered on Sunday at the Arsenal uh, in the evening, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very exciting. It has so. What did Les Cubas turn the uh, the the play of Gas into? Well, that's really hard to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, For what, instance, when you the saw music. when you saw the rehearsal, what yeah. did you think of it? I I just thought it was very exciting. I heard a lot of the sort of mechanistic, mechanical uh, types of things, these harsh rhythms with mm -hmm. these um, drums and uh, certain instruments. And then on the other hand, uh, certain kinds of distortions and almost caricatures. At some point they're saying, gas, 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 gas. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes on. It's not how um, opera singers normally use their yeah. voices at all. Um, I personally liked some of the moments that were intended, I think, I think to satirize the kind of romantic idea of, uh, of um, bel canto singing, mm. but I actually loved the way the voices came together. Yeah, okay. But then, of course, you weren't allowed to sympathize too much with that. Yeah. Um, also, I found it interesting the way the... Um, the director was trying to convey certain types of stylized movement mm -hmm. um, and, and use the voice in a, in a different way. But of course, that was only a rehearsal, and I think it was the first time they had all gotten together. Mm -hmm. So we have to wait a few days to see okay. what comes out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait. Coming back to the, uh, to the topic of uh, dancing. Uh -huh. If it's even possible, could you compare the history of uh, the development of a dance in Ukraine and in the U.S.? Because obviously those are two different stories. Yes, well, that's very Two different <laughs> cultures, two different histories, uh, so two different stories. I would say that in, by the 1920s um, and 1930s, the, the presence of an academic theater of ballet um, in Ukraine meant that there, there was a Sovietization, a Russification of a, of a lot of the, um, of the repertory. So as an academic theater, you had to dance Swan Lake. There was never Swan Lake before the revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to do um, a, a Sleeping Beauty or a Bayadeo. There was a whole series of ballets that enter into this, if you will, the Soviet space. Uh, and uh, of course, there were a few national ballets on national themes that were done with national, um, with um, national composers, etc. The U.S. didn't have a national theater, mm. and one of this, it still doesn't really have a national theater. We have ballet companies that perhaps are more eminent than others. But for instance, the New York City Ballet, which I would consider the most eminent company, is not, an, is not the American ballet. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, called the Nash, it's called the New York City Ballet. And in a sense, it represents it needs to be much changed. more. <laughs> no, 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 no. no okay. <laughs> I'd rather keep what it New York City. <laughs> you are the expert. Uh, I'm a New York City nationalist. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> That's I see. a different thing. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but I think what was encouraged um, because of the lack of this national theater, 
um, was a great deal of exploration of different forms of dance. So that, for instance, in the 1930s, when the New York City Ballet didn't exist, mm. when other big ballet companies didn't exist, there were small groups, certainly, and touring companies, um, the so-called international companies that would tour from Europe, like the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. Um, there were also, there was a really exciting modern dance movement uh, with notable figures like Martha Graham and Doris mm -hmm. Humphrey and others, but there were many, many uh, of these things. And I think it was the absence of a dominant form uh, which somehow took precedence over something else that um, allowed for this kind of liveliness. Mm -hmm. In the 1930s, also in the 1960s, there was a great, a very lively a burgeoning uh, uh, forms, and I emphasize the plural of um, contem you know, forms of contemporary modern dance, but also very interesting things were even happening in the ballet world. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that I think would distinguish um, U.S. and in particular uh, dance in New York City, which, and New York City of course was the dance capital, it still is, um, the national dance capital. Um, but it distinguishes that from, I, th I think, most other um, centers. Mm -hmm. Even, for instance, London. London in the 1950s was, or 60s, was very different from New York City in the 1950s or 60s. Thank you so much for coming to our <laughs> studio. Thank it you. It was a very interesting conversation. <laughs> Uh, that was Lynn Garofula. She is a dance historian, professor of dance at Barnard College, Columbia University. Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned with UATV for more.